throwing you. <laughs> yeah, what's up? Welcome to Gamer Nation, and yeah, Jess is kind of... kicked his butt. Whatever, man. Anyways, you guys, we got an incredible show about blockbuster movies turning into video games. That's yes, right. you guys have been watching The Hulk, Incredible Hulk game, Matrix, Enter the Matrix. Interesting fact, video games annually make more profit than all blockbuster movie videos combined and movie hits. Wow. Get that. Wow. Wow. So I certainly hope all you poor Hollywood saps will be tuning in today as we show you how we change your visions into video games. Hmm. But before we get into that, you guys, we're going to check these little clips out first. So check this out. In a land of mighty kingdoms. Threats emerge. Ancient alliances are reforged. And an unexplored world awaits. Blizzard Entertainment proudly invites you to experience Warcraft from a whole new perspective. Stake your claim. Live the legend. A world awaits. The world of Warcraft. Yo, dude, man. What can I say? After watching that cinematic masterpiece, this is going to be an off-the-hook game. World of Warcraft, man. Blizzard does it again. You guys know they bring the cinematics to another level. Make sure you guys get it, because this is awesome. Konami knows one thing. Gamers are nostalgic about the 80s. Hey, man, check it out. I'm from the 80s. With that in mind and a great 80s license in their back pocket, Konami's bringing back what? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. With a cel-shaded look and all four mutant turtles at your playable disposal, this one is high on the hyper meter. Yeah! yeah! Now check this out. Each of the four turtles has completely different combos and fighting styles, which is good. There are few mindless action games in this style anymore. So the resurfacing of the turtles on this major console is definitely welcome. Yeah, it's a button masher. The cowbunga dude, it's a fun button masher. <laughs> Hey, I'm Gigi, your guide to the underground world of video gaming. You know, some girls like their man tall, dark, and handsome. 
but I like my man just the way he is. Short, hairy, and Canadian. I'll introduce you when we come back. And here is my man now. Some call him Weapon X or Logan, but I call him Wolverine. And I just love it when he dresses up for me. Now you can catch our Canuck in his classic yellow and blue and many other recognizable outfits by going to the main menu and pressing B X B Y Y Y L L Z. What a hottie. What's up, man? This week on Reviews We Got, yeah. That's right. You ever thought about what it would be like to be Genghis Khan? Rise of the Nations, baby. All the way from, like, the beginning of time up to 2003, you get to choose what civilization you would like to rule as king and build it, take over the world, the whole shebang. So anyways, my man Dan, Dan the man over at IGN, tell us a little bit more about Rise of the Nations. Big Huge Games undertook a big huge project when they decided to create their first title, Rise of Nations. Not only did it try to be a historically balanced RTS, but it also borrows heavily from turn-based strategy gaming in its multiple winning conditions, national boundaries, and slick campaign mode. The game is broken up into skirmish, multiplayer, and single-player campaign that plays half like the old board game Risk and half like a traditional RTS. Like most historical strategy games, there's a heavy emphasis on resource collecting, city building, and research before you can even get your feet wet with the combat. You'll have to move from the days of bows and arrows all the way to the power of modern technology such as nuclear strikes. With so much to think about, such as research, building, expanding, exploring, upgrading, and training things can get a bit confusing with hundreds of units on the field and sometimes impressively intelligent AI. But once the battle gets started in earnest, it doesn't stop. The pace is undeniably addictive and you'll soon be tired as hell from all those late nights staying up to play the game just one more time. The many civilizations may not be extraordinarily different and some of the turn-based elements such as multiple victory conditions don't work quite as well as they have in turn-based arenas, but those problems can't knock the fact that Raising Nations is an impressive game with lots of strategy. It would be hard not to recommend this game to veteran strategy gamers. That's some powerful stuff, Dan, and uh, to my right, we got, uh, what's your name? Justin. Justin. So what do you think about Rise of the Nation? It's pretty cool. I mean, it's an RPG. It takes a little bit of time, but uh, you can really get to enjoy it. So would you, like, recommend it? Uh, must yeah. have? Yeah, I'd, I'd recommend it, definitely. So it's definitely recommend. Yeah. Righteous, man. Yo, check this out, man. The next game we got, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. 300 monkeys are off the limit, charts loose, and you are Jimmy the Ape. No monkeying around. You got like a billy club and like a net, and you got to catch 300 monkeys and eight escape too. And yes, right, my man Doug is, he's been monkeying with this game for a little bit. Doug, <laughs> tell us a little bit about Ape Escape 2. Uh, Ape Escape 2, very good platformer game. It's a very funny game. It's filled with monkeys. Everybody loves monkeys in their games. And basically, it's finally come over the States. You're Hikaru, and you have to find this group of evil monkeys who have now these little helmets on their heads and make them smart. You have to capture them all and bring them back, and um, bring them back in time, because they, you know, they want to destroy the world. The neat thing about the game is that it uses little PlayStation 2 analog sticks in very inventive ways. In fact, the first one almost always used those. It's great for kids, it's great for adults, and I really strongly recommend it for anyone who's, you know, from age six to age 40. Yo, Doug, that's some serious monkey business, and uh, business to my right over here. What's your name, man? Joe. Where are you from? Livermore. What's, like, the funnest thing about it? Um, uh, just original. It's old school gaming at its best. It's kind of like Donkey Kong, or? More like Mario, really. Right on. Would you recommend it? Must have or yeah. which one? Must have it or you gotta have it. You got you gotta have it. You got to have it. Ape Must Escape have. 2, you absolutely have to have it. But on the next game, probably most of you guys already played it, but Soul Calibur 2, not one, part two. And uh, this one, let me tell you something. There's two new characters. There's Necrid from Todd McFarlane, but I mean, good God, there's Spawn, man. If you got Spawn in a game, you have to buy it. We're going to find out a little bit more from my man Fran, Fran, Fran at IGN. Tell us just how cool Soul Calibur 2 is with the Soul Edge Sword. I don't have to tell you how cool it is because this game speaks for itself. This is the anticipated return of Namco's Soul Calibur franchise, which originally released on home consoles on the Dreamcast. 
Now it's available for the Nintendo GameCube, the PlayStation 2, and the Microsoft Xbox. Now the kicker is, on each one of those consoles, you're going to get an exclusive character. On the Nintendo GameCube, you get Nintendo's own Link, who's from Legend of Zelda. On the PlayStation 2, you have Namco's Heiachi character, who you've probably seen in Tekken. And then, on the Microsoft Xbox, you have Todd McFarlane's Spawn. So it really is about the characters, they're awesome, it's going to be hard to choose. Now, in terms of single player value, you've got a Weapon Master mode, which is all new. You're going to be sent down missions, and you're going to face all the characters from the game. And while you're doing that, you're going to earn money. And what you can do with that money is you can buy new weapons. Now, the cool part is you can actually use those weapons in that mode. Now, how cool is it to take the giant hammer from Legend of Zelda and slam it down on an opponent? Move over Gallagher, right? So, what's Soul Calibur 2's overall worth? Well, it's really a great buy on all the consoles. It's one of the best fighters out there, and undeniably, it's beautiful. Now, you're going to have to choose which character you like best. That's probably going to be your hardest purchasing decision, but it's a definite recommended buy. Right on, Fran. And uh, this is my man over here. What's your name? Brendan. Brendan. Where are you from? I'm from Berkeley. Berkeley. What would you guys think about the game? I, I like Soul Calibur too. It's very fun. I played it at my friend's house. So how would you compare it to, like, Street Fighter? You can't hit people while they're down okay. in Street Fighter. In this one, you can. So it's like a it's like a realistic Street Fighter, basically. So would you say it's a must-have, recommended, or you can wait? Recommended. Okay. Very recommended. It's a very fun game. You think people from Berkeley would recommend it? Yeah, I would. <laughs>
It was a cool thing, but actually us at IGN, we've been compiling a whole list of movie turned video games, and my homegirl Jessamine, where are you at? to tell us a little bit more about it. Thanks, Jason. As he said, we are back here at IGN with one of the editors, Chris Carl, where we are going to talk about that very subject. So, Chris, which movie franchise would you say has spawned the most games? I would say it's probably the Star Wars series of games. <laughs> kind of got the whole ball rolling with the movie movies being made into games with Star Wars the arcade game and it's just blossomed from there. It seems like Star Wars is something that really captures gamers' imaginations. So you've got really great games throughout history like the arcade game and then a TIE Fighter on the PC and as recently as the GameCube we have uh, uh, Rogue Squadron and coming up there's like a whole ton of games planned including Galaxies which will allow like tons of gamers to come in and play online. Great. And um, everyone knows that the E.T. video game was a monumental failure. Oh, yes. <laughs> Were there any other games based on movies that fell short of expectation? Well, for a long time, it was like every movie licensed game was falling short of expectations. So you got things, wacky things like Friday the 13th and Jaws on the Nintendo. And... Uh, more recent titles like Driven on the PS2 where you're like, what were they thinking? <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's, I mean, there's, there's been probably more bad than good over time and, uh, and everybody knows it, but I think, I don't know, it might, might be getting better. Okay, I want your personal opinion here. What do you think was the most influential um, movie to game adaptation to date? I would say it was probably uh, GoldenEye on the N64. Uh, it pretty much resurrected that console's life. It saved it. It also put Rare on the map, and it made it made like console first-person shooters like good. They, it was finally like, okay, we can do this on a console. It doesn't have to be for PC only. So, and it also has spawned a whole series of Bond games. So, for all those reasons, and the fact that it sold millions and millions of copies, I think it's probably the, the best movie license today. And have recent uh, movie adaptations, would you say they've gotten better as time has gone on? Oh, for sure. Games like uh, Lord of the Rings and uh, re more recently, like, Enter the Matrix, which incorporates, like, new movie footage shot um, directly for the game. I think those things are all, you know, much, much better than their predecessors. And we're headed down the right path. And flipping the coin a little here, um, which video games to uh, movies have been uh, the best? Well, recently, I think Resident Evil has been great. It kind of captured the flavor of the video game. And before that, Mortal Kombat, I think that's a very underrated movie, even though, like, gamers know about it. So it's been great, you know, like, recently. Great. Well, thank you so much, yeah, no Chris. Problem. Well, there's the inside scoop on movies to games and games to movies. Hey guys, for the next game, I'm gonna let you choose the cheat. Would you like the red one or the white one? I'll let you know what your pick is when we return. See what you get for picking the right one? You now get to unlock the code for unlimited life. To do this, go to the hacking screen, select cheat on the left, then type 7 F 4 D F 4 5 1. Unlimited focus powers can be achieved by going to the hacking screen. Select cheat on the left, then type 6 9 E 5 D 9 E 4 at the 8 point. Well, that's all for now, but I look forward to cheating with you again next time on Gamer Nation. Yes, this is Ray Lewis himself, man. Stoking the fire.
looks good. It's down the middle. Now, aren't you gamers glad that we super glued your butt to the couch today? <laughs> and don't worry, that cushion will eventually fall off your bum. It'll fall off. Besides, wasn't it worth it? Of course it's worth it. You guys are watching Gamer Nation, and today's lesson, don't just watch the movies and play like nine bucks, play the movies, you know what I'm saying? That's right, because if you don't like the ending, you can make your own. Game over. Over. This time on Canadian, feel a little bit more pro Canadian. Okay. <laughs> and Canadian. <laughs> Now, aren't you gamers glad that we guys... Take it again. <laughs> now, aren't you gamers proud? One more time. I'm so sorry. I got it. Be sure to visit us at GamerNationTV.com. Gamer Nation, produced by Our Tribe Productions, in association with IGN Entertainment. Thank <laughs> you.